of Board Game Blitz, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network and a podcast about all things board games that you can listen to in less time than it takes to think of 115 different less time than it takes to phrases. Board Game Blitz is sponsored by Gray Fox Games. This week, we're continuing last episode's list. First, we discuss a couple games we've played recently, like Project L and Cartographer's Heroes. Then, we finish our top 10 1 in 100 games from BGG's 1,000 to 2,000 ranked games. And now, here are your hosts, Ambie and Crystal, plus special guest, Matt. Recently, I got a review copy of Project L, which is an engine-building spatial game with polyominoes designed by Mikhail Mikas. Jan Sukal and Adam Spinell. Sorry for mispronunciations. But Project L was a Kickstarter, and it will be a Kickstarter again. <laughs> so on October 12th through 29th, I think, they're having a new Kickstarter, which we'll link in the show notes. But this, I guess what I got was their older edition. I don't know, I'm not sure what's changing in the new Kickstarter. Yeah, Mark Street had a copy of this at Dice Tower West, and everybody <laughs> was clamoring to play it with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty fun. So if you've played Splendor before, it's similar, like the engine building feel and there are cards that you're gathering. So I played Project L twice each, solo and two players. I played it solo twice and two player twice. So the way it works is there's cards in the center, then each card is worth a certain number of points and also has like a shape on it. Well, a couple of shapes, like one shape that you're trying to build and one shape that you get as a reward. So you have... A supply of shapes and these are just like polyomino shapes that are different sizes and colors the colors don't matter it's just each each different piece is a different color but you you take a card from the center and you want to build it using the shapes that you have and so the the shape in the card is like a big shape <laughs> you, know, you put multiple polyominoes in to fill it up and once you fill it up you complete the card and you get the points and you get a new shape that the card gives you so your shapes never go away you just keep building up a new supply and and it gets bigger and bigger which is cool because that's the engine building part and on your turn you get three actions so the actions are like take a card or put a piece into a card but the coolest action is called the master action and you can place one piece in each of your cards and you can have up to four cards so you you want to be efficient and get a bunch of cards and then if you have a lot of pieces you put one into each card so you can like build a lot at once which is fun to to plan out and build the shapes and and I, I really enjoy like the engine building part you plan out which shapes work well with your pieces and like put in shapes get more shapes and then get new cards to build more shapes I, I really like that so it was a similar feeling to splendor with the quick engine building part and also the point conversion like similar to splendor um, I tend to go for the engine building part and and then I don't get as many points at the end of the game because it ends really quickly and someone who went for the points is going to win <laughs> because I just keep focusing on the engine building and not getting as many points. Like, whoops. <laughs> but but that, that's part is fun. And, but then also in Splendor, when someone takes a card that you're going for, it can be very sad. But in this one, it's not as bad because you can build pretty much any shape since you have all these different polyomino pieces. It just some of them take more pieces than others. So... It, it, I felt like it wasn't as mean as Splendor. And then also with the solo game for Project L, it's it plays a little differently. There's an AI that just takes the highest scoring card each turn, but there are sp- spaces that you can block somehow. So you're trying to block the AI from getting those highest pieces, and <laughs> it's, it's really hard. <laughs> so I only played it twice, but I haven't won. The second time, I managed to tie on the easiest level there's there's three difficulties and i played standard difficulty but it, it feels a little different in solo mode and i like that one too so it, it's puzzly uh if you like spatial puzzles polyomino games and you like engine building like in splendor then you should try out project l and the kickstarter will be live uh in, on october 12th so check that out well, similarly to you, I am also talking about a game on Kickstarter, but <laughs> mine is already live on Kickstarter. So I was so happy that Thunderworks Games was kind enough to send me a preview copy of Cartographer's Heroes, which is a standalone expansion mm. to Cartographer's. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Cartographer's, I believe I've talked about it on the show before. It is 
my favorite roll and write game. And I say that confidently right now. There are a lot of roll and write games I like, but Cartographers is my favorite. And in Cartographers, you are drawing polyomino shapes onto a map. You're building a map with different types of terrain. Cartographers Heroes is one of those standalone expansions that I really love because it does all of the things that base game Cartographers does and just adds little bits of interesting new mechanics and features. So it doesn't mix things up too much, but it also doesn't like only tweak it a tiny bit. In Cartographers Heroes, the differences from the base game, some of the monsters that you'll end up drawing on your sheet have special abilities. And so things like if a zombie gets drawn on your sheet, if you do not surround it basically immediately, the zombie will start to spread and it will add more zombies to your sheet and they will go out of control very quickly. Or there's a troll that when it gets drawn on your sheet, every round it will destroy one of the spaces surrounding it like a troll would if it ended up in your kingdom. And so it can potentially mess up your ability to score certain areas. But as the monsters get more powerful in this game, you have a tool to fight them, and that is the heroes, the namesake of the game. There are hero cards that can pop up, and you can draw heroes onto your map that can then fight the monsters that have shown up. And what's neat about the heroes is they each have a different hit pattern. So when you draw the hero onto your map, the hits will go in a different orientation depending on which hero was drawn. And the hits will go off regardless of when a monster theoretically shows up. So you can put a hero out in the middle of nowhere if you want. And then later, if a monster gets drawn next to it, it will just automatically hit that monster. Obviously, the people drawing monsters on your sheet are probably not likely to make that happen <laughs> for you. But it is possible. We found that the hero cards were could be frustrating if they didn't show up the right times. Like we were having heroes show up before monsters more often than not and I think it would be better if the monsters show up first then the heroes because then you can actively fight them a little more easily then as part of this kickstarter they also have three new map packs the the base game itself of cartographers heroes comes with new score sheets that are different from the original game but they also have new map packs that have special abilities I only got to try one of those and that is the Neblis map pack the plane of flame and that puts a volcano onto your sheet that is then going to explode and the magma will flow from the volcano and destroy the land as it goes so I haven't gotten to try the other two map packs but that is just an extra little thing that you don't have to play with but you can if you want to i adore cartographers and i also adore cartographers <laughs> heroes you can combine it with the base game and you can mix all of the elements together which is interesting because base game cartographers has cards that deal with the ruins on the map and heroes does not do anything with the ruins but they were smart enough to make sure that there were ruins on the new maps because if you do combine the games you would need them there so this was very intelligently designed and developed I think in a way that makes it really easy to incorporate the two games together if that's something you want to do. So let's say you're a person who doesn't own cartographers or cartographer. Well, you don't own cartographers yet. And you're thinking, should I buy one, both, neither? What should I do here? I honestly think anyone would be fine picking up either base game cartographers or cartographers heroes and just having one of them. But I think if you're a person who really loves this game already, you've played it and you love it, I think having both does have some value because it adds new types of terrain, new shapes of terrain, and combining everything together is just going to give you more variety in the types of cards that come up, which if you kind of memorize the deck in the base game, this would be a neat way to mix it up. So that way you'll be less certain of what things could be possible to pop up in the deck. I love it. I'm so grateful that Thunderworks was willing to send me a copy of this. I cannot wait to see the final version. But yeah, two big thumbs up for me for Cartographer's Heroes, which was unsurprising. But yeah, I love it. <laughs> this week, we are continuing the list from last episode. We are heading into the final 500 of our Top 10 1 in 100 <laughs> games from the Board Game Geek 1001 to 2000 ranked games. Is everyone confused? <laughs> I am. Let's go. <laughs> 
So my pick for 1501 to 1600 is a little bit of a cheat. It isn't technically, but it kind of is. So I am going with Alia Iacta Est, which is Latin for the die is cast. And this is the game that Order of the Gilded Compass is a re-implementation of. And I have played oh, okay. both. So this is not entirely a cheat. I really do love Alia Iacta Est, but I think Order of the Gilded Compass is better um, mm -hmm. I like the new stuff that got added to it when Gray Fox Games picked it up. Um, but yeah, Aaliyah Ayakta Est really struck me when I first played it, and I love it a lot. I probably will not play it anymore because Order of the Gilded Compass exists, <laughs> but I had to put it on here because it's a game I really love. As far as dice allocation games go, I think this is a great next step game after Las Vegas. So if you like dice, simple dice allocation games, this is one to look into if you do see it somewhere. It is out of print, I believe, but again, and Order of the Gilded Compass is not, and our sponsor, Gray Fox Games, sells it. So use the code at the end of the episode to get yourself a copy of underrated title Order of the Gilded Compass. It comes crystal recommended. <laughs> My pick for the 1501 to 1600 was Dr. Eureka, which is a speed game. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a kid's game, but... It's a fun kids, game, probably. though. Yeah, I, I mean, it's I've never game. played you it have... with kids, and I yeah. like it. <laughs> yeah, I haven't played it with kids either. You have these test tube with big marbles in them, big colored marbles, and then you're trying to get certain combinations of colors. So you flip a card over and it shows you the test tubes with the different colors in them, and you have to pour the test tubes back and forth, and you can't touch the marbles. You can only pour, touch the test tubes, and you're like pouring the three test tubes back and forth to get that combination. So whoever gets it fast, it's wins the card. And I always I, lose. I, I'm horrible at this yeah, game. Yeah. So I, I like speed games. Like Nine Tiles is one of my favorite games, and it's a similar feeling to that. So I don't own Dr. Eureka because I have other speed games, but, but this is a fun one. All right, my pick for 1601 to 1700 will come as no surprise to anybody <laughs> who's been listening to our podcast for any amount of time, and that is Strike. <laughs> so... <laughs> I, I can't pick anything but Strike in a group of 100. I mean, if, if Strike ever ends up uh, up against one of my favorite games, I'm going to have a really big problem on my hands as far as that's concerned. I do want to give a shout out to my secondary pick for this group, though, which is the classic game Rummy Cube, which I've mentioned on the show in the past. I played it with my grandparents when I was a little kid, and I got to play it again at PAX Unplugged this past year. Listener of the show, Nick Baker, and I played it together, and I loved it just as much now as I did back then. So Strike is my pick, but Rummy Cube gets a runner-up nod. My pick for this was really hard because there's so many good games that I like. I honestly, I don't envy you having to pick in this group. For you specifically, <laughs> it's bad. Yeah, so I, I'm just going to say all of the ones that I like. So Strike was up there. And then there's also 1860 and 1817, which are both really good 18xx games. And then also like Pit, which is a fun bidding game. But then uh, The Ravens of Three Sahashri is one of my favorite games. Um, I think it's in my top 10 right now. So yeah, that, that beat out the other ones. It's a two-player asymmetric cooperative game. Very unique, and I, I really like it. <laughs> I definitely still want to play Ravens of Three Sahashri at some point. I think mm -hmm. Elissa and I, my friend, mm -hmm. we like playing yeah, a lot yeah. of interesting two-player games, and I think she and I pr would probably have a lot of fun with it. Yeah, yeah. My pick for 1701 to 1800 was kind of tough. I struggled with this one a little bit, and I settled on Happy Pigs. Happy Pigs is a surprisingly cute looking game, but it is not cute in its gameplay. And there's a lot of really interesting strategic decisions in it. You are raising baby pigs, feeding them, vaccinating them, and eventually selling them, where they go live on another farm happily forever is what happens to them, definitely. <laughs> I really love Happy Pigs. I think it doesn't get talked about enough. It's one of Yellow's best titles, at least as far as the ones in my collection. But mm -hmm. my runner-up in this category is going to get mentioned by Ambi here in just a second, so I'm not going to mention it. But it, what Ambi's about to talk about was a close second for me. So <laughs> Happy Pigs was my pick. I still haven't played Happy Pigs, but I remember I think you and B Cassidy both talked about it a while ago. <laughs> and I, was, I had been wanting to play it for a while but I think you would really like yeah. it yeah <laughs> so my pick in this category was Bill Roddy which was a runner-up for Crystal <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, it's a cooperative game where you're trying to figure out a fake paintings 
the, so there's going to be like categories of paintings that you're trying to put in and everyone has a hand of cards and they're putting in the paintings. Some people are putting in paintings. Other people are guessing which ones they put in. And then there's the fake artist, which is Bill Roddy, And that's the game, uh, the rat artist. And they're putting in random, random cards. And so it's all gets shuffled up. And like a lot of times what the rat puts in is are things that like really match really well. <laughs> so it's really hard to, he's a good to forger. guess everything. Yeah, he's, he's a good forger. <laughs> so it's, it's a pretty fun party game. Because, well, I like cooperative card games, and like it plays up to seven players, which is a lot for a cooperative card game, I think. So so you can play a lot of people, and it's like also deduction, like thinking about trying to get into other people's minds like oh they did they play this one because they're thinking of this which i also like like a lot of cooperative card games that i like are trying to get into other people's minds so i like that about it so this game when i was at bgg con in 2018 like board game geek themselves had gotten a few copies of the foreign like printing of this and had them for mm-hmm. sale in their booth. And I was lucky enough to grab one. But it, it has American yeah. distribution now, but it didn't at the time. And so all of my friends were super excited when I got it. <laughs> all right. My pick for 1801 to 1900. This one, honestly, this was this group of 100 wasn't super impressive as far as I'm concerned. There are a few games in there that are really good, but some that I haven't played. And so the one I went with is a game that I do like and I do own, and that is Muse. So honestly, mm-hmm. when Muse came out, there was a lot of buzz around it, and then it kind of dropped off pretty quickly. I'm not quite sure why. I really like Muse. It's similar to games like Dixit or mm-hmm. Mysterium in that it has big cards with like weird artwork on them. But what's different about Muse in comparison to those other games is Muse is a team-based game where you're trying to give clues to your teammates and trying to get them to figure out your clue before the other team can. And the clues that you're giving, unlike Dixit or Mysterium or whatever, like in Mysterium, you're just looking at cards. In Dixit, you're usually saying a single word. In Muse, the type of clue you give is also on a deck of cards. So sometimes you have to draw something in the air with your hand or use or whistle something, or hum a thing, or there's a lot of weird ways to give clues. And so you can't just think a single way and just give like one word clues like you do in most of these other guessing games. So it's different in that way. It's really fun. I like the team-based aspect. Mm -hmm. So I I had a runner up in this category, a la carte, which is a fun fun. dexterity game, which I've talked about before, where you're literally shaking ingredients out of little plastic bottles. It definitely has a fun and silly factor, but I had to give it to Muse because I think it's a really cool game yeah both of those are good my pick in this category was my current favorite 18xx game which is 1849 the game of sicilian railways i think i've mentioned it before but it's got a lot of things going on um and what i really like about 1849 is well one it's a short game that's good at three players which is the player count that i usually use to play 18xx games at i haven't played a game in a long time so but also there's a lot of things that happen with timing. You're like trying to build out track and then get the right train for it. And the train rush is is really fun to time. And there's interesting things with, there's a 20% share that's not the president's share that you get as the last share. And it's really fun to try to time to get that one because it's really good to get that. And so all the games that I've played of it, which aren't that many, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really enjoy it and I really want to play it again when I can get people to play 18xx again in person. <laughs> uh, we do not know when that day will be, but eventually. Yeah. yeah. All right. My pick for 1901 to 2000. This was also not a great group of hundred for me. <laughs> like there, there were a few games in here that I've played like a handful of times that I was like, that are okay. Like mountains of madness is good situationally. And then there were two games that I struggled with, like to pick one over the other. And I think I'm going to go with Zombie Dice, which Zombie Dice is definitely not a complex game. It's really simple. This is not, you know, fancy. It's not 
really strategic. It's a, just a very simple push your luck game. But I want to go with it because it is one of the first games that I bought when I was building up my own board game collection. And I started introducing board games to my friends that hadn't mm-hmm. played them. And this was a really easy one to break out anytime and teach. And everybody picked it up really quickly. I do still own it to this day. I haven't played it in years, but I have a fondness in my heart for zombie dice. So I'm going to pick it for this hundred. Uh, my other runner up, Ambie's going to talk about here in just a second. Yeah. And that game was Tokyo Highway, which is my pick for this category. There's a new version that's four players, but the one I have and enjoy is two player dexterity game. And you're, you're building this, these highways out of popsicle sticks and you're putting little cars on them and you're trying to cross over or under the other player's highway before any other sticks are over or under there. And then you get to uh, put, place a car on your, on your highway, which is basically like the points. You're trying to get rid of all your cars to win. So it's interesting because it, there's like some strategy in it to try to build so that you, you can build over the other your opponent's highway and then like block them from building over yours. And so it's a strategic dexterity game, which I think is, is pretty interesting. And I, I really like it. I don't like the four player version as much, but I'm pretty sure it was the two player version that was in this category. So I believe you're correct. And yeah. I, yeah, I've only played the two player version as well. Honestly, the reason I didn't go with this one is because I have only played it a couple of times. Mm-hmm. So it's hard for me to say like, whereas I've played zombie dice, way more time than (laughs) I can even, you know, so I think that's why I had to give it the edge. But Tokyo Highway is really fun and it looks really neat on the table. It's got great table presence. I think anybody who walks by and sees this game set up is like, ooh, what is that? (laughs) Yeah. All right. So that wraps up our top 10 one in a hundred games for BGG's 1001 to 2000. Uh, You all requested this. That is why we did this list. We did have to break it up into the two episodes so we could fit it in. But this has been really fun going through this and I would love to continue it. You know, if maybe a few episodes from now, if you all want to hear us continue the list beyond 2000, definitely <laughs> let us know for the record during a pandemic. Sometimes it's hard to come up with topics for, <laughs> for board game podcasting. So if you all want more of this, we are more than happy to oblige. So we've got our special guest, Matt here with us tonight, Matt of the games that we discussed this evening. Are there any in our lists that you've played and particularly like? I, know, I saw Mountains of Madness mentioned, um, which is, like you said, a good game situationally if you have a good group. Other than that, no, a, a lot of the, a lot of the games on the list didn't didn't line up with where I was going, or, or just aren't games I've played. Oh, that's interesting. So, what were there were there any in this grouping of, on BGG? I saw it looks like you were looking. So, were there any that you, that stood out to you in any of these uh, in this list? Yeah, I think Andy Borden Cards did a they bought the license to it was originally a game called you dirty rat and they reskinned it in the dystopian universe um called it grifters where it's a deck building game where you you everything is delayed so you can either play the cards for their effect or use their symbols to complete a mission but then it takes three turns for them to get back into your hand so you can do a whole bunch of stuff in a turn but then you have to wait a while to get that back and trying to balance when you complete missions versus when you use the cards for their effects is is really, really fun. That sounds interesting. Yeah, I think it's somewhere in the 1900s. Okay. It is fascinating to me as we go through this, like how many games I am familiar with and we're 2,000 games down on Board Game Geek's top ranked games. You know, like obviously we've been playing board games for a while, but it's just fascinating to me. I This is one of those moments where I'm like, I wonder how many board games I know about. Like, maybe not even necessarily have played, but, like, just names that if you said them to me, I'm like, yes, I've heard of that game. I really am curious (laughs) to know, like, how many board games exist in my brain. (laughs) Yeah, it's a lot. (laughs) Honestly. When my friends or, like, my family or my old coworkers would talk to me about, oh, like, do you know this game or something, they, they would go in expecting me to say yes <laughs> because they're like oh yeah you know all the games <laughs> no I have the same thing happen with me because co-workers would like oh you know I was over at my brother's house and they brought out this game where you like 
and they would describe the most yeah. vague thing ever. <laughs> and I would instantly would be like, it. oh, King of Tokyo, <laughs> you know, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Like, and they would always just be blown away by how I was instantly able to nail the game that they were describing. And admittedly, yeah. when you're talking about people who don't game seriously, you know, there's a subset of board games that they're most <laughs> likely to be playing, but still, yeah. it always impressed them and made me feel very cool. Yeah, Toby and I like playing that game. And actually, like, at our friend's wedding, they, they had a gift. <laughs> like, they, they were get, opening their gifts, and, and we saw one that looked like a board game shape box. And then we were looking at the size of the box and, like, feeling it. And we're like, huh. And, and then we, we guessed it right. <laughs> I don't remember which game it was. But, yeah, just based on the size of the box. And, like, we also picked it up. <laughs> that actually oh, sounds yeah, it was like... Sherlock. It was Sherlock Holmes Consulting. Oh, that that's, is a pretty, that's, that's, a, yeah, that's so. a unique box size, yeah. kind of. I could see that. No, it, <laughs> I would actually like to, maybe at some point for Dice Tower tonight or something else, like play a oh, game yeah. where, like, describe a game as a non-gamer who's only played it once. <laughs> You know, like, try. I know, like, and see, maybe I could get Eric in the chat and Dice Tower tonight to guess games that way. That might actually, am I in charge of the game this week? Who knows? I might have, you know, I know this, this episode is coming out in October and we're recording it in early no, September. So yeah, September. this is going to be possibly in the past. So this is, yeah, this is past Crystal speaking to you now about something that may have already happened. <laughs> Any other games that stood out to you, Matt? I mean, you get the BGG skew because there were a lot of sort of the party games in 1500 mm, yeah. to 2000. I mean, you've yeah. got Mafia to Cuba, Chameleon, mm. Fun Employed mm -hmm. as well in there. For sure. Yeah. People need to rate those games higher. They're tons of fun. <laughs> I know. I know. And if you all didn't hear our picks for 1000 to 1500, make sure you head back and listen to our previous episode because there were some good ones in there. And that's it for this week's Board Game Blitz. Visit our website, BoardGameBlitz.com, for video and blog content, as well as to get links to all our social media pages. This episode was sponsored by Gray Fox Games. For the month of October, you can get 20% off your order of all non-exclusive items sold at GrayFoxGames.com by entering the promo code SPOOKYBGB at checkout. You heard right, 20% off amazing games like Bushido. Gray Fox Games, quality games cleverly crafted. Support our show and get cool perks for as little as $1 a month by visiting Patreon.com slash BoardGameBlitz. As a patron, you'll get access to pre-edit recordings and our private Slack channel where you can chat with us and other Blitz tiers every day. Our theme song was composed by Andrew Morrow. Technical support provided by Toby Mao. Board Game Blitz is part of the Dice Tower Network. Until next time. So play a game or two. Pa -pa play a game or two. Bye, everyone. Bye. Um, but you have these test tubes with big balls in them. Like big marbles, I guess. They're they're bigger than marbles, but smaller than like balls. But anyway, <laughs> I but, think maybe but, you should back that up and not <laughs> just say marble. Okay. Twenty percent off amazing games like Bushido Gray Fox Games. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes games have like exclamation points in the middle of them. Right, right, right. <laughs> no, that was just me trying to make it exciting. <laughs> okay.